Let's tackle each component of the general linear test and see how we can use the different terms we've already seen to form this F statistic. Let's start with the reduction in air. Remember, we're comparing the amount of air in the full model and the amount of air in the reduced model. The reduced model is a model in which we hold constant one of the model terms. That is, we're simply not using it to make a prediction. So the reduced model will always have more air. So in forming this reduction in air, it's the sums of squares air from the reduced model minus the sums of squares air for the full model. Next, let's talk about the number of parameters added. Now notice that the reduced model will always have fewer parameters than the full model. So the difference in degrees of freedom for the reduced and full models will capture the number of added parameters we have. We can write this as the degrees of freedom air for the reduced model, which will be larger, than the degrees of freedom air for the full model. Finally, let's tackle the baseline air. That is, what baseline amount of air we should expect in the world when we're simply taking these samples. Now it turns out we have two different measures of air in the population. We have air in our full unrestricted model, the model in which we also fit TAWs or T's in our sample, and we have the air from a restricted model where we're not fitting those treatment offsets. Now I'll give it away, we're actually going to use the air from the full unrestricted model, that is the air around individual groupings, and so it'll be the variance of this epsilon that we use in the denominator. But I want to give you a sense of why this is the air term we want to use, why this is our best unbiased estimate of the population variance. The reason why is when the null hypothesis is true, and in this case we're using random groupings, so the null hypothesis is true by default, Notice that the air around our treatment groups is really the same as the air around the grand mean. Since these groupings are random, that air is simply random as well. So even though we're fitting treatment offsets, that epsilon term from our full model is still giving us the best unbiased guess of the population variance. And since we're forming our test statistic given the null hypothesis as being true, then this really does make sense to be used as our air term. But I want to give you a slightly better reason why. When we don't have random groupings like we do here, when instead there really is a treatment effect, we still want to be using that epsilon term from the full model because that term will not be contaminated with the treatment offsets. Let's consider our actual groupings now. And this is a situation where we're actually asking the question of whether that variance of the TAWs in the population is zero. Let's see why the air term from the full model makes the most sense here. So let me give you our groupings, our actual treatment offsets. So this is the prediction for all the individuals in the first group, the prediction for all the individuals in the second group, and the prediction for all the individuals in the third group. Remember the prediction for any individual in any group is just that group's group mean. So our air term in this full model will be the air about these particular predictions, the air of the individuals within their individual groups. So let me do one thing here. I'm actually going to separate these individuals and spread them out in their individual zones. So those are all the people in the delta group spanning their particular group mean, all the individuals in southwest and virgin spanning their group means. Now, when we're considering the air from this model, what we're really doing is centering all these groups about a deviation. So dollars different from their own group's average. Now, if those groupings really exist in the population, then this is the amount of air we should be considering. Because if those groupings were to differ dramatically from each other, for instance, Delta was exorbitantly more expensive than the other airlines, we wouldn't want to consider the deviations of all the people in the Delta group to the grand mean, we would still want to consider the deviations to the Delta group. So notice, by centering around the group means for each individual, we actually get an unbiased estimate of the population variability around those groupings. So if we were to use the restricted model in this case, let me flip to it here, a restricted model when we're simply looking at the deviations of each person to the overall mean, that will actually have a little bit more air because that air will include the treatment deviations as well. Remember, when we're partitioning our models, or partitioning our points to be one part air and one part treatment, we remove any treatment effects from these measurements. These epsilons are uncontaminated by treatment differences, if they're actually there. But the restricted model doesn't have those treatment offsets in it. 
So any of these deviations, if the treatments really exist in the population, will be contaminating that estimate of epsilon. Now in this case, it's not particularly obvious that we're contaminating much because this is a situation where the treatment offsets are not very strong. But that epsilon term will be incredibly important from the full model because it will be uncontaminated by the treatment offsets if they are there. So let me give you another situation where we actually have tremendously large treatment differences. In fact, a situation where all we have are treatment offsets. So when we looked at a functional relationship, like the function of cost for laundry based on the number of loads of laundry, this is a situation where all we have are treatment offsets. There actually is no error in this model because we can predict perfectly the cost that somebody will spend. So this is a situation where H1 is definitely true. The variance of the treatment offsets is definitely different from zero. But let's consider what type of error we would see if we were using a reduced or restricted model. In this case, we would take the deviations for every individual to the grand mean, and that would be those green offsets. In fact, it would be every individual we measured. Remember, we measured 100 randomly selected individuals. They happen to, in each of their different groups, pay the identical amount, but that's because there is no error. There actually is no error in this model, and yet what's masquerading as error here is the treatment differences. So all of these are actually treatment offsets that are masquerading as air if we're fitting a model without using loads of laundry. And so if we're doing this model comparison approach, that epsilon term from the full unrestricted model is uncontaminated by the treatment offsets if they're actually there. Now we don't know if they're there or not. That's why we're doing this whole model comparison approach. We want to test whether those treatment offsets really are there in the population. That's our main interest. But if we're doing this hypothesis test and we need a denominator error term, a benchmark for how much prevailing error there is in the world, it makes sense to use the epsilon term from the full model because that epsilon term from the reduced model is actually going to be contaminated if there really are treatment differences. So in our general linear test, the baseline for error that we use are the sums of squares error from the full model and the degrees of freedom error from the full model.